Welcome to Lesson 6C, Buoyant Gaussian Plumes. Today we're going to add buoyancy to our Gaussian plume equation, but first we're going to do a coordinate transformation to account for the ground. Let's look at our simplified Gaussian plume equation from the previous lessons, and that's this equation here, where we have the source m dot js right at the origin where z equals zero, and z at the ground is then going to be at negative hs because hs is this height of the stack. And we have our normal Gaussian looking distribution here. It's a Gaussian equation. So if I plot cj as a function of z, where z starts as zero here, that is the normal Gaussian curve that we expect for mass concentration. Now let's consider some location here. This is some z, I'll call this z equals z1, and that's the location of interest, some point of interest. What's the concentration there? Well, the concentration there will be right here. So that's the concentration at location z1 at some x1, let's call it. So we would put in z equal z1 to get that value in this equation. So we're going to do a coordinate transformation. What we're going to do is make z equal 0 on the ground, because that makes more sense. And from now on, we're going to be using z equal 0 on the ground. So this will be a simple coordinate transformation. And the coordinate transformation will be such that we will be at the same point. So I'm going to redraw what I sketched up here at the same x1. We have some concentration now that looks the same as it did before. This is the center line. Our point of interest here is that same point as we had up here, okay? But we're moving our z to the v0 at the ground. And so at this x1, we go up to the center line of the plume, which is a height hs, that's the stack height, plus this z1 that we had before. So the actual total z then, z is equal to hs plus z1 at the point of interest. Now, physically, these are exactly the same plumes. They're at the same location. This point of interest is the same as here, the point of interest. So all we've done is we've moved the z-axis down to here. So this is now the origin, but the source is up here. So now instead of the source being at the origin, the source is at z equal hs, and the origin is down at the ground. So if you think about this transformation, all we have to do is use z minus hs in place of z in the above equation. So notice that instead of that z, we have z minus hs. So this is the Gaussian plume equation with z equals zero at the ground, whereas the one up here, which we used before, was the Gaussian plume equation with z at the source. The only thing we did was change from z up here to z minus hs down here. Now in our new transform coordinate system, this point, same point physically as we had before, this point of interest is now at z equal hs, the stack height, that gets you to the middle of the plume, plus our z1 point of interest. So that's the same physical location as we had here, but now when we plug it into here, z minus hs, at that point of interest is hs plus z1 from here minus hs from here, and that gives us z1, which is the same as we had here. So in other words, these two are identical at any point of interest as long as we use the proper z, which now is from the ground location. So z is zero at the ground and goes up, whereas here z was negative hs at the ground and we went up from the origin at the source. So that's our first transformation, and all we did was change the z coordinate. Now we are going to modify additionally for a buoyant plume as promised. And so what's a buoyant plume? Well, most plumes from smokestacks are hot and they rise before they level off. So we're going to call delta h the additional elevation above the stack exit due to plume buoyancy. And so let me just show you a quick picture. This is a smoke plume from a very tall stack. And you can see that it is buoyant because it goes up and then it levels off here. So the stack height would be hs, and then the delta h would be that additional elevation due to buoyancy. So let's define capital H as hs plus this delta h. That will be the effective stack height where we will put our source. So how do we do this? Well, again, the easiest way 
is to just transform Z again. We're going to leave Z as the ground, but we're going to just transform so that this source is now up here instead of right at the top of the stack. So instead of the source being at HS, it's now at HS plus delta H, which is capital H the total. And so Z equals zero at the ground as before. And to go to the center line of the plume, we have to go up to Z equal H. So Z equal capital H up to the center line. And that's where we're going to put our source. So what we're really doing is we approximate that the source is at Z equal H above the stack here at this location to account for buoyancy. And then we have the same horizontal plume as previously, which I now show in purple here. So this is the plume we're actually modeling. This is the real plume, but we're going to kind of wait till it levels off and put our source up here. So we have the same equation as before. We'll just have to transform Z again. And we ignore this part of the plume. So we really can't say much about what's going on here until this thing levels off. But most of the time we're worried about way downstream where this plume starts interacting with the ground anyway. So that's not a big issue. And so this will make a very simple model. So mathematically, we're going to do the same transformation that we did before, just a coordinate transformation. And we are going to look at what we did before quickly. All we did was, since we had the source at HS from the ground, we transformed from Z to Z minus HS. That's what we did up here to give us this equation. So we changed Z to Z minus HS. Well, now, instead of just at HS, our source is at capital H, which is HS plus delta H. And so now we put the source at H from the ground. So the transformation from Z to Z minus H. Same equation as above, except instead of Z minus HS, we have now Z minus H. And so this is all the transformation that we have to do to account for buoyancy. Now, of course, we're not really accounting for buoyancy properly. We're just ignoring this part. But like I said, for far downstream, once this thing levels off, we do account for buoyancy simply by pretending the source is up here where it has leveled off. This is our final workhorse equation. We'll label this as the Gaussian plume equation with z equals zero at the ground and buoyancy included. And I should comment that we also have the same other restrictions that we had previously. And those are that we can only apply this between x equals zero and xg and actually not even x equals zero. There has to be some x where this becomes valid. Let's call it xb for the buoyant plume where we don't really deal with that. So we'll actually change that to XB here, some buoyant location. And as long as X is between that and where XG would be where this finally hits the ground far away, we'll talk about ground effects next. And then it's steady and U is constant and all the other approximations that we made before, such as diffusion in X being very small compared to advection in X and that type of thing. So now we're ready for an example problem. A chemical plant emits a gaseous air pollutant under the following conditions. Stack height is 80 meters, so we call that HS. The buoyant plume rise is 20 meters above the stack exit. I'll call that our delta H. And then we can combine these actually and get our H. Capital H is HS plus delta H. So that would be the 80 plus the 20, or in this case, 100 meters. So the effective stack height above the ground due to buoyancy and the stack height there is 100 meters. So that's what this location is then. In this particular example, the source is up at 100 meters. And then we have our mass concentration distribution Gaussian at some X location of interest. And that's where we define here X as 0.545 kilometers at this point of interest. We also have capital U of 5.0 meters per second. And then the stack emits pollution at 110 kilogram per second. So that's our M dot J S. So once we label everything. It's just a matter of plugging into the equation. It's an overcast morning. So again, this is a hint to look at the Martin model. So we'll always use the Martin model, unless I would tell you differently. And so this is review for you. Look that up. And this is a class D 
what we're asking here is the maximum mass concentration of the air pollutant in milligram per meter cubed at this X location of interest. So you have to think about where this max concentration is. I didn't give you a Y and a Z location, so I'm asking you where is the maximum mass concentration? Well, obviously the maximum, since it's as a Gaussian, the maximum in the Z direction will be right here at the center line of the plume because it's a Gaussian and it falls off as we go up or down in this view from the side. The same thing is true if we would draw this view from the top like we've done in other cases. In other words, if this Z were a Y instead of a Z, then we would still have CJ max at the center line of the plume, in that case horizontally. Here it's vertically. So we can answer this question and actually makes life easier. We say, where is the maximum mass concentration of the air pollutant? It is at the location where Y equals zero in the horizontal direction center of the plume, and Z, where is the Z location of the center of the plume, and that would be at Z equal capital H at any X location that we're talking about. So we just pick some X of interest. So the maximum concentration is in the plume, it's inside the plume at its center line, in fact. And where is the center line? It's at Y equals zero, center of the plume horizontally, and at Z equal H, which is the center of the plume vertically. So we're going to get this point right here, which is the maximum maximum. And if we were looking from the top, it would also be in the center of the plume looking down from the top. We are going to set y equals zero and z equals h in our equation. And a very interesting thing happens in this particular problem, and that is because this EXP term, so EXP of all that stuff in there, equal one because this inside turns out to be zero. So if we set Y equals zero, that's a zero there. And if we set Z equal capital H, that's a zero there. So zero plus zero doesn't matter if they're squared and the half doesn't matter. This thing inside the brackets, the curly brackets of zero, EXP zero is one. And so this is one at Y equals zero and Z equal H. So that's nice because now we just eliminate all that stuff to calculate and we can just write our answer then as CJ max is equal to simply M dot J as the source over the denominator, which was 2 pi u sigma y sigma z. And so that's our answer in variable form. And so now all we have to do is calculate the numbers. Now, what I'm going to do here is not show all this because I want you to do this as a review. And I already told you this is class D, but of course on the quiz or on the final exam, if I give you a problem like this, you will have to look at the wind speed and the type of atmospheric conditions, et cetera, to figure out what class class it is, figure out what coefficients A, B, C, D, F to use for your sigmas, and then you'd have to calculate sigma Y and sigma Z. So this is all review, class D at X equals 0 0.545 kilometers, plug everything in, and you should get your final answer. Make sure you are able to get this answer, and I'm going to give it to three significant digits. So CJ max turns out to be 4,500, three significant digits here, milligram per meter cube. So watch your units and all your calculations, and so that should be your final answer. So do this on your own before you try the quiz to make sure you can get this. Now, one other comment about these kind of problems, and that is that you really should use software. These equations are starting to get more involved. Now, this one is easy when you realize that EXP of the brackets turns out to be one since what's ever in the brackets is zero. But that's not always going to be the case. So if you're doing a homework problem or a quiz question and you have a different Y and or a different Z, it's best to put all this stuff in software. Plug all this into Excel or MATLAB or whatever software you want to use. Make sure you get the right answer by hand and with software. And then once you're confident that your software is working, then that's a good thing to use on quizzes to help you not make any algebra mistakes. And as always, always watch your units. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.